Subic Bay is like nature's gift to navies. Imagine a perfect spot for ships, discovered way back in 1572 by explorer Juan de Salcedo. For a while, Spain had their ships parked in Cavite, but that place had its issues. Too cramped and easy to attack. So they looked at Subic Bay and thought, why not here? By the late 1800s, the Spanish were going all in. They dug, built, and transformed Subic into a top-notch naval base. It's like moving from a tiny garage to a massive, secure parking lot. By the time the 19th century wrapped up, Subic Bay wasn't just a bay, it was a statement. A statement that said, look at us, we're ready for the big league and naval games. And just like that, Subic Bay became a major player in the world of ships and seas. The 1898 Spanish-American War was a game-changer. Under the lead of Commodore George Dewey, the U.S. fleet made a resounding splash, outclassing the Spanish in Manila Bay. This naval mastery set the stage for American dominance in the region. With the end of the Philippine-American War, the stars and stripes waved over Subic Bay, turning it into a key American naval reservation. What we are looking at today is not only your new president, but a brighter vision for Subic, for Longapo, for Bataan and Sambales, and certainly for our country and people as a whole. During World War I, Subic Bay played its part. It served as a crucial supply and repair point, supporting U.S. and Allied naval operations in the Asia-Pacific. But politics and diplomacy soon intervened. The Washington Naval Treaty of 1922, aimed at preventing an arms race, capped the size and number of naval vessels among the signatories. This meant that the bustling activities at Subic Bay took a downturn, with shipbuilding and fleet sizes restricted. However, this silence was temporary. As World War II's storm clouds gathered, the importance of Subic Bay surged once more, readying it for another chapter in naval history. So in any event, uh, we did ship out of uh, San Diego and we went to Guam. And from Guam then they broke us up uh, there was about 12 to 15,000 of us Marines, and half of us went to, uh, I was there in 45 until 47. And in fact, uh, on the 4th of July of 1946, uh, I was representing the Marine Corps in the track meet with a bunch of other Marines from Subic Bay. And on that day, the Philippines officially got their independence, so on the 4th of July of 1946. The 1940s were not just any decade, they marked a seismic shift in global power dynamics. With Nazi Germany rapidly annexing territories in Europe and Japan pushing its boundaries in Asia, the strategic significance of the Philippines, particularly Subic Bay, came into sharp focus. As the shadow of the Japanese Empire loomed large, the U.S. faced a difficult decision. Rather than allow their prized naval facilities to fall intact into enemy hands, they adopted a scorched earth approach. At Subic Bay, this meant systematically destroying vital infrastructure, including docks, repair yards, and fuel depots. I was there for until from uh, December of 45 until May of 47. So there was big changes, and we were there when, when the Philippines got their independence. However, when the Japanese took control, their indomitable spirit and urgency transformed the bay. It soon buzzed with activity as they initiated extensive shipbuilding operations, turning the bay into a pivotal naval and logistical hub. Additionally, Subic Bay saw the dark side of occupation. It became a holding site for prisoners of war. The story of the Orioku Maru stands out as a particularly grim chapter. Initially a passenger liner, it was repurposed to transport over 1,600 Allied prisoners in December 1944. Lacking adequate facilities, the ship was a floating hell. Prisoners were crammed into cargo holds with minimal air, food, or water. Over the course of a harrowing journey, marked by attacks from Allied aircraft unaware of the human cargo, more than a third of the prisoners perished. This tragic tale serves as a stark reminder of the brutalities of war and the human cost of global conflict. General Douglas MacArthur's legendary pledge, I shall return, was fulfilled when U.S. forces began their campaign to reclaim the Philippines in 1944. The liberation of Subic Bay played a pivotal role, with its deep waters and strategic location making it invaluable in the Pacific Offensive. After the war's dust settled, 
the U.S. recognized Subic Bay's enduring strategic value. Massive investments poured in, transforming it into a modern naval juggernaut. The bay's infrastructure grew, with new docks, repair facilities, and support structures coming up. By the time of the Vietnam War, Subic Bay had become the primary logistics hub for the U.S. 7th Fleet. At its peak, tens of thousands of U.S. military personnel were stationed there, with ships often anchored side by side, showcasing Subic's role as a linchpin in U.S. Pacific operations. The year 1991 became indelibly etched in the memory of Subic Bay's inhabitants. Mount Pinatubo, dormant for centuries, awakened with a violent eruption that was the second largest of the 20th century. This climactic event spewed vast amounts of ash into the atmosphere, affecting global temperatures and causing major disruptions locally. Airports, communication lines, and other infrastructure were paralyzed. As if nature had conspired against the region, Typhoon Yunya collided with the volcanic aftermath, creating lahars, deadly flows of ash, rock, and water that devastated communities and vital installations. Subic Bay's infrastructure, a symbol of naval prowess, was suddenly vulnerable and overwhelmed. Understanding the urgency and potential human toll, the U.S. military initiated Operation Fiery Vigil. This massive evacuation effort saw an incredible coordination of sea and air assets. In a matter of days, over 20,000 dependents were airlifted from the base to safer ground in Guam. This mission not only showcased the U.S.'s logistical capabilities, but also emphasized their commitment to safeguarding lives over assets. Biostic tensions across, in the, across, Taiwan, across the Taiwan Straits uh, seem to be continuing to increase. Then the safety of our Filipino nationals in Taiwan becomes of primordial importance. And so that uh, these EDCA sites will also prove to be useful for us. As the dust and ash from Pinatubo began to settle, Subic Bay found itself amidst a different storm, one of political and strategic evolution. The U.S. had enjoyed almost half a century of naval primacy in the bay, thanks to the 1947 Military Bases Agreement. But as time wore on, tensions grew. The Philippines, with a burgeoning sense of nationalism and a desire for greater autonomy, grew increasingly skeptical of foreign military presence on its soil. By 1991, these sentiments reached a climax when the Philippine Senate voted not to renew the lease for U.S. bases, leading to a formal departure by the end of 1992. However, the strategic importance of Subic Bay was undeniable. Both nations recognized the mutual benefits of military cooperation. This realization paved the way for the Visiting Forces Agreement in 1999. Instead of a permanent base, this allowed U.S. troops to be stationed in the Philippines on a rotational basis for joint exercises and training. For example, the annual Balakotan, shoulder-to-shoulder exercises symbolized this renewed defense partnership, underscoring Subic Bay's continued significance in a rapidly changing geopolitical environment. We're talking about lives! We're talking about people! We're talking about people who will not be able to clothe their children! With a boat of 11-11, and adding my own negative boat, the city is defeated. After the U.S. Navy's exit, Subic Bay faced a dual challenge. On one hand, a vast expanse of military infrastructure awaited repurposing, and on the other, the environmental legacy of decades of military operations was evident. Pollution, unexploded ordinances, and toxic waste became primary concerns. For instance, studies found significant heavy metal contamination in the bay's sediments, affecting marine life and potentially local communities. The cleanup and rehabilitation process was neither swift nor easy, necessitating collaboration and investments. In the face of these adversities, Subic Bay's transformation was remarkable. Facilities once destined for military endeavors were repurposed. The region attracted investments and became a hub for shipping, industry, and even tourism. By 2015, a blend of its strategic location and upgraded infrastructure saw it reborn as an essential U.S. Navy resupply point. This evolution, from a potential environmental quagmire to a strategic maritime asset, epitomized Subic Bay's resilience and adaptability. The year 2022 didn't just mark another passage of time for Subic Bay. It heralded an era of reawakened strategic importance. The South China Sea, with its labyrinth of disputed territories, emerged as a crucible for global geopolitics. China, 
bolstered by its economic clout and expanding naval fleet, had made significant territorial advances, establishing artificial islands and militarizing key zones. The Philippines, once focused on domestic growth and independence, found itself at the crossroads of these larger power plays. The Scarborough Shoal standoff and ongoing disputes highlighted the vulnerability of its maritime interests. Consequently, the U.S., the Philippines' longtime ally, found fresh impetus to reinforce its presence in the region. Enter Cerberus Capital Management, a U.S. private equity behemoth. While their investments typically veered towards profit-driven ventures, their acquisition of parts of Subic Bay's port signaled a deeper strategic intent. Sources whispered of investments exceeding half a billion dollars, emphasizing the port's significance. This move wasn't just about assets and equities. It was a countermeasure, aimed at offsetting Chinese expansionism and echoing Subic Bay's storied legacy as a linchpin in global geopolitics. Subic Bay's geostrategic relevance is like a phoenix, ever renewing with the times. When Roland C. Paulino, the astute chairman of the Subic Bay Metropolitan Authority, SBMA, spoke of the region's unparalleled value, it wasn't mere rhetoric. He was channeling the lessons of history and aligning them with emerging global realities. The bay's strategic location, practically at the heart of the Asia-Pacific, makes it a crucial node for military logistics. Think back to the Cold War era. Subic Bay was a vital cog in the U.S. machinery, not only during the Vietnam War, but also as a counterweight to communist expansion in Southeast Asia. Fast forward to the present, with the Asia-Pacific becoming a hotspot for great power competition, Subic Bay's advantage of enabling rapid military responses becomes even more pronounced. But it's not just about geography. The Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, EDCA, of 2014 lit a beacon. While the agreement catered to broad defense cooperation, Specific clauses allowed for increased American rotational presence, capacity building, and shared facilities. Military analysts have observed a spike in joint naval exercises and war games, some simulating defense against large-scale aggression. There's also been chatter about augmented investments in the Bay's infrastructure, potentially making it fit for accommodating advanced naval assets. The ebb and flow of power dynamics have continually sculpted Subic Bay's narrative, First identified for its strategic importance by Spanish explorer Juan de Salcedo in 1572, has been a nexus of geopolitical and environmental events over the centuries. From its development as the Arsenal de Olongapo in the 1800s by the Spanish to its prominence as a vital American naval base post the Spanish-American War, it has borne witness to major global conflicts, notably World War II. However, its resilience was not only tested by wars. In 1991, the simultaneous wrath of Mount Pinatubo's eruption and Typhoon Yunya challenged its very existence. Yet Subic Bay persisted, reinventing itself in subsequent decades. With treaties like the Visiting Forces Agreement and the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, it continues to emphasize its enduring significance in the Asia-Pacific region. Thank you for tuning in into our analysis about the Subic Bay. If you enjoyed the video, check our previous uploads and do not forget to like, share, and subscribe our channel. If you found this video insightful and want to see more, check out some of our previous videos and hit the subscribe button to stay connected.